Dear Diary, today we are going to be talking about women and femme oppression, like we do most days on this podcast. Um, like my other entries, I will start by defining terms for you that we'll be using in conversation, and then I will take my own experience and listener submissions to put that um, into context for us. However, this episode will be a little different. Um, instead of having us submit struggles with woman oppression, I wanted to take time out of the podcast to highlight the good things about being femme. So, um, I left the option and the space for you to talk about your struggles, but I also encouraged you all to submit things you loved about being femme. Like I said, I think it's important to highlight the good in this episode. I know that I sometimes get caught in a cycle of only pointing out the bad, because when you see it every day, that's really easy to do. Um, so, uh, we're going to start off talking about our struggles, um, but I wanted to kind of balance that out with some positives, um, because I think like the last episode was pre- pretty positive, but... I think with the topic that we're talking about, we deserve to carve out space for us to talk about what we love about how we identify, um, and I think that's really important. So, I wanted this episode to be a chance for us to define our own experiences and reclaim our womanhood and our femme experience, because we are focusing on women and femme oppression. Um, and going into my social justice course, I knew what femme oppression was, but I maybe didn't know how to talk about it or, you know, all the things it encompasses. But after, you know, reading for weeks on um, social justice and oppression and discrimination, I have a little bit of a better understanding with these terms, and I think that's in, it's important that I use them um, because there's a lot of people like me previously before this course, I had no idea how to talk about these things um, in, I guess, an educated way. I was just taking the terms that I heard thrown out and using them, and sometimes that's not the best thing. Um, but again, we do with what we can. Um, and that's also okay, Um, but educating yourself is a really big um, step in your own social justice journey. In one of our first weeks in class, um, femme oppression and women's oppression was one of the first topics that we, like, actually read about and talked about, and we read this piece by Marilyn Fry, and before this point, I hadn't really read anything in the class that, like, elicited a reaction or like made me think more in depth than I already had um but reading Fry's piece gave me almost a visceral reaction I she put into words exactly how I felt as a woman in society and like I knew I knew I felt these things Um, and I had this, like, internal battle with, like, how I'm supposed to present myself, how I'm supposed to cope with the things that society hands me, but I didn't, I wasn't able to verbalize it. And Fry does this really well. Fry paints the picture of internal, of the internal battle, but includes both perspectives, both the female and society perspective um and she uses this with a birdcage analogy and she does this with a birdcage analogy she states also I'm still glancing over to my right to reference so I do not misquote but she states if your conception of what is before you is determined by this myopic focus You could look at that one wire up and down the length of it and be unable to see why a bird would not just fly around the wire any time it wanted to go somewhere. Now, what I think Fry is saying is if society is only looking at the one problem, the one thing that we're stuck on, they fail to see the entire system that's in place to keep us down. 
Um, and it's like, we aren't just struggling with getting passed up for a job one time or getting called a stereotypical remark from a person. We're stuck in this cage because there's millions of wires surrounding us at all times. And sometimes it feels like only we can see those wires, but those wires are patriarchal society. They encompass us and surround us and keep us down in certain ways. It's not just a one or two time instance where a bad thing happens and we're calling ourselves oppressed. There is a system in place to keep us in this inferior position. Um, And when society denies patriarchy and how it works then they're failing to see those other wires and they look at us in this what we see as a cage and they just see as a single obstacle and I think that really puts into perspective our internal battle of like I was put here to fail essentially and like there's no way for me to succeed past a certain point Like, I can walk up to the wire and poke my head out, but I can't fully get my body out of this system of wires until society realizes, oh, she's trapped, they are trapped, we should open that door for them. And opening that door and working together as a society to finally acknowledge the wires and help the people inside the cage that's going to be us coming together and through work dismantling this patriarchal society that we have. And I wanted to talk about this passage because there are a lot of times where we feel like a bird in a cage. Like people are watching a struggle, denying our struggle, and even demonizing us for our struggles all because they don't see the bigger picture. They don't see the system working around them as well. The system affects them. I think that's one thing we misunderstand about the patriarchy is it's not just a woman's problem. It's a man. It's a gender nonconforming problem. The patriarchy picks us all up and refuses to put us down because we get stuck in the cycle of continuing the system because it's societally acceptable. No one's going to stop what they're doing if they're being rewarded for it. And I think society rewards patriarchal behavior. And with it being so big in society, I feel like it's kind of become a spectacle. Like we watch these inferior feeling people struggle and we don't help them because we're benefiting. So we just leave it as is. We acknowledge them. We say, hey, you're doing great. One day it'll get better. But we never actually step in as a group as a group to help them out because there's only so much that an individual can do an individual can comfort and call out and bring attention to things but they cannot fully change a system on their own but like I was saying I think society feels obligated to watch us experience these things and it kind of validates that oh they're doing the right thing because that's what that's how this society is supposed to function um And I think a lot of the femme experience is being perceived. We're perceived by the lens of society every day. Um, And, you know, we're told these expectations of how we're supposed to act, react, and overall just exist. And, you know, through that, the femme experience is perceived in many different ways I think everyone has their own definition even society Um, and I think the societal definition is based solely on stereotypes and assumptions Um, but our own definition is based on true feelings and experience and when I was trying to define my femme experience I kept stopping myself because I would say something stereotypical or what I thought was like a stereotype and I felt like I couldn't embrace that thing just because society said I should but what's stopping me from embracing something that makes me feel good 
if this thing about womanhood or being femme makes me feel good, I shouldn't make society dictate whether I like it or I don't. Even if they say I should like it, I should not pay attention to what they are saying and reflect on myself and see, is this really something I enjoy? Am I being told I should enjoy it and that's why I'm enjoying it? Or do I genuinely like this experience? I think this goes into a conversation about social constructs, which make the patriarchy function. Um, We participate in these social constructs, but I think the difference between participating in them because we have to or feel like we have to and participating in an action because it makes us feel good is completely different. One of the things I love about being femme is my emotions. Sometimes I'm not great with my emotions. I compartmentalize a lot, but you know, I go to a movie and I cry and there's something kind of like, I feel connected when I do that. But on top of that, that's a stereotype, that's a construct, but it makes me feel connected to who I am. I should be able to embrace it without the repercussions of society. I have a quote from uh, Judas Lorber um, in this article, Night to His Day, The Social Construction of Gender. I'm going to read this because it it explains social construct um, a little bit. It says, societal statuses are carefully constructed through prescribed process of teaching, learning, emulsion, and enforcement. And I think this points out that Sometimes it's not our fault when we fall into social constructs um, and places in society where we're supposed to fall because we're being spoon-fed this from childhood. We're being told girls are pink, boys are blue. Girls pick daisies and make flower crowns and boys jump on the jungle gym and run around and get dirty. And if we find comfort in those things, I think sometimes it's a way of coping with these social places we're supposed to be. But I also think we learn to love the things that we're exposed to. Um, And that should be okay, but it should also be okay to step out of this social construct that we're in and we're given and step into other things that are outside. So like if I want to get into sports, or if I was a little girl and I wanted to go dig in the mud, that should be fine. But because we're trained from the beginning, sometimes we get stuck of just being in our bubble. And again, sometimes that's okay. But I think acknowledging first that you are stuck in a bubble and like hey it's okay to do these other things is a very good thing but it's okay to claim the stuff that maybe society expects you to like because maybe you do actually like those things um and I think I was struggling with that because you don't have to fully get rid of all the stuff you were taught what you need to do is question why you were taught it why you believe it And that's one of the best steps you can take in your own social justice journey is acknowledging these things that society has taught you um, and finally questioning them. And that that takes takes a while. Um, And sometimes it's hard because it's things that you thought were like gospel and were written in stone. And then you learn that they're not and you have to rationalize that and that's okay. So, that all being said, I challenged you, my listeners, to do the same thing. To, I asked you to define your experience. I asked for you to provide a list, a story, a poem, a piece of art, anything that would help you express your experience and kind of reclaim that as well. Um, So, let's get into our submissions. Some of these submissions are a little longer, so I will be holding my phone to read them um, just to make sure I don't 
ruin anyone's submission because these were really good and they made me feel they made me feel I guess seen but also good that I was giving other people the chance to say you know what what may what they loved about being femme so we have a submission from my friend Jay um and when I first read their submission, I absolutely smiled. It made me very happy. Okay. Jay says, I love being overly dramatically femme. It's so fun. Makeup, hair, heels, corset, everything. It feels so good to walk down the road in heels, knowing I look good as hell. Oh, and I love the idea that other people see me in full hair and makeup and feel like they can be pretty too. But I also love the softness of being femme. Like, I don't want kids, but I love the idea of being a mother figure to a friend in a safe space. I also love doing things that are usually male-dominated while being done up dramatically femme. Something about playing a guitar in a corset is so powerful. Jay, uh, I love you. I say this after every submission, but I love y'all. Um, I think being able to embrace non-stereotypical femme things as femme is so fun like for me I watch sports in a very feminine way but I love it and that should not be frowned upon I should be able to do that you should be able to do that everyone should be able to do that you don't have to identify as femme to do something a little more feminine and that's so fun um I also love the playing a guitar in a corset I'm sure you feel so powerful. I would feel powerful if I could play the guitar. <laughs> I also love that you brought up, you know, softness because I feel like sometimes that's um, something that's placed on all femme individuals that we're supposed to be soft. Um, and sometimes we don't want to be, but I think, at least for me, I find comfort in softness. Um, and so being able to embrace that because you like it, not because someone else told you to, is also very powerful. Um, so, Jay, thank you for your submission. Um, I loved it very much. All right, our next submission is from my friend Mel. Uh, Mel said, I definitely, because, okay, let me preface. This submission um, form, I asked for your, you guys to put everything you loved about being femme, and I also said that you could leave examples of times you felt seen in media, whether that's a scene, an actress, an actor, a line from a show, a line from a book, um, because there's no simple way to verbalize um, the things that make us feel secure in our feminist or comfortable, so I wanted to give options for people to express that however they needed. So, the submission is from Mel, and Mel said, I feel, I definitely feel seen by Lily Reinhardt. As silly as it sounds, she inspired me to write poetry about my life experiences. Another time was recently while watching Black Panther Wakanda Forever, when one of the leads was a Latina woman. Seeing someone like me in a huge position in a Marvel movie made my dream seem not so big and far. This happened again in Doctor Strange with Sochi Gomez um, when she was casted. She's a young Latina actress, also in the MCU, which is where I'd love to be, playing a Latina character in the Spider-Verse. Mel, I better see that. <laughs> Let me continue. Lastly, seeing the breakout star that is Jenna Ortega all over media is huge for me since she started in a show that I grew up watching and now she has a number one hit TV show on one of the biggest streaming platforms. I think bringing in who we feel seen by is very important um, because within society we kind of have to have these things that we grasp onto and so being able to be encouraged and seen by people like us is extremely important and I also think it goes with the femme experience of feeling so connected to people like us um, that we find comfort in it um, so Mel thank you for that submission that was very good I hope to see you in the spider-verse one day are you kidding that would be literally amazing maybe I'll be the director who knows <laughs> I have 
um, another submission from Junie, who killed it last time and is back again. Um, Junie says, Something that has always made me feel happy to be femme is the general feeling of a sisterhood. Like going to a public bathroom and getting complimented on your outfit, or asking your friend if they can check you when you're on your period, or being asked if you can keep an eye on someone's drink. I've always felt safer and more protected around femmes just because I feel like we tend to look out for each other, regardless of how well we know one another. There's just something so sweet about a girl you don't know complimenting your shirt or having a sibling-like figure give you advice during a sleepover. Uni, that was really sweet. Um, I think it really points out the little things we do to kind of get by. Like... Like, asking someone to wash over your drink at a party or in, like, a busy area, I think is our way of being like, hey, sometimes society isn't great, but we can make it great for each other, and we can keep each other safe. Um, and, like, the the little th- comments in the bathroom or the compliments, I think as femme individuals, we found ways to get by and even though it's sad we have to do that, I think it's really beautiful that we can find these places in everyday life to not only make ourselves feel better, but to make other people like us feel better. And I think that's really important that we continue to do those things because when those things go out the door, we're all going to be miserable. (laughs) Um, So I think it's very nice that you brought up these small things that we do as a community um, to make each other feel seen and to make each other feel safe. Um, so thank you, Junie. So my best friend, Siobhan, um, we have a lot of very, um, in-depth conversations and I think it's a little different than most friendships because we talk about some deep stuff sometimes. Um, but it's really beneficial to talk about these things with your friends just by the way, because they're saying things that you can relate to, but maybe in different ways, or they'll say something that like you don't know about but they get to educate you and they won't judge you for that and they just your friends want to share knowledge with you that's like one of the big things of friendship so if you ever get the chance where these topics come up talk about it because it is so refreshing and Siobhan and I have done this a lot in our friendship where we get on a topic and we just start talking about stuff that is either like a struggle for us or like a pattern we're seeing and we talk it through and it's really awesome. Um, And so I was talking about this episode and um, the concept of loving being femme and they wrote me a little piece to read and I'm very excited to read this. Um, It's long, that's why it's going to be our last submission Um, and then we'll wrap it up but I wanted to share this with you because I thought it was beautiful. Siobhan called this romanticizing personal femininity in a male gaze world. She added a quote by Margaret Atwood that says, You are a woman with a man inside watching a woman. You are your own voyeur. Siobhan says, At some point in a young girl's life, we have all strived to be that girl. You know the one, effortlessly sucking on a gigantic cherry lollipop alone in her room, reading a novel with a shirtless Jason Momoa type on the cover, Or, the big shirt, no pants, crying, eating ice cream in bed, and still looking clean and pretty type. Or, the, I could go on, but you get the gist. Most of us grow up internalizing this picture-perfect idea of what it means to be feminine when we are existing by ourselves. An idea that was created by men for the viewing pleasure of other men. I remember being a young girl, no more than 12 or 13, and painstakingly positioning my body before I fell asleep in a way I thought that would be attractive to any imaginary male ghost who would sit and watch me throughout the night. Thank you, Twilight. (laughs) I spent years crafting an image of myself that would hopefully get the boy my age sitting across from me in the airport terminal to look up and say to himself, her, she's the one. I also did all of this while growing up fat, so it's safe to say I've never had the whirlwind airport romance. I never had that airport romance. However, as I grew older, I figured out the best way to get male attention was to hypersexualize myself in an attempt to compensate for the aforementioned fatness. I was hot, I was sexy, I was fuckable. 
but I was not pretty. I wanted to be, more than anything, the pretty girl, the soft, lovable girl, but my rounded curves and edges felt like daggers when men who were smaller than me tried to touch me. But I feel like a pretty girl when I'm eating sushi and Skyping with my best friend. I feel like a pretty girl when I'm ugly crying over Call Me By Your Name with my hair greasy and matted. I feel like a pretty girl when I'm sitting in bed in my underwear on my period eating chocolate my dad bought for me while I read fan fiction. And most importantly, I feel like a pretty girl when I can exist uninhibited and freely without worrying about how a man would see it. Now, these powerful words um, struck me when I first read, read them because... I don't think I realized how much I was catering myself to this male gaze and to society's gaze because I never questioned it. And then Siobhan read this to me and I said, oh my God, I've been doing this my whole life. I also think that the way they phrase trying these things as a young girl and then throughout their words, they wrapped it up by saying, I was able to reclaim these things because I can exist freely without worrying how I'm being seen. I can finally embrace these things that I was trying to do and look good doing or get validation from doing, but now I can do them for myself. And I think that's really, really important. Also, the contrast of the beginning, trying to be seen pretty as pretty but then saying I feel like a pretty girl when I'm alone in my room hair matted hair greasy eating and those are things that we're supposed to feel ugly doing so I think having that and showing that we're allowed to show these stereotypical feminine emotions in different ways and to different things especially different things than what society perceives is very important because that gives us a chance to, you know, break free of how we're supposed to look, how we're supposed to feel. Thank you, Siobhan, for giving us that beautiful closer. Um, it was eye-opening for me when I first read it, so I hope you guys had a similar experience. I also thank everyone else who submitted things. Um, it was amazing. And if you had a submission and you didn't see it in this episode, I'm filming this pretty late, um, but I also, I was behind schedule. I uploaded the submission form um, last night, and I'm recording now, um, so if you didn't get to fill out the submission form until later, um, then that's probably why your submission is not here. Um, I would still love to read y'all's submissions, so if you have a submission and um, you want it read, let me know, um, and maybe I can do a little bonus episode with some of the submissions we didn't get to uh, today, um, but I thank you so much for being here and so much for um, joining this community. I had my first two episodes go live last night, um, and <laughs> there's a whopping 20 views, so to the 20 people that watch, thank you so much, um, I am very excited to post these last two episodes, I'm posting this one, um, and then our closing episode, um, and then we'll see where we go from there, um, but again, I thank you so much for being here and contributing, because this, podcast and this conversation would not happen without y'all's submissions so thank you so much um i hope that you're enjoying it so far um but in the meantime don't be a stranger and i will see you in the last episode